It's hard to say what comes first. Is it, is it just for the beauty or is it for the botanical collection? A garden is, to me, the expression of my aesthetic self using plants as the medium. So gardens are part of what makes us human, really. You know, there's a, there's a restorative element to a garden. I never thought of myself as being particularly obsessive, but I think it takes an obsessive personality to do something like this. Gardens, for me, are a place of intense cultivation. Some gardens are cultivated for productivity. This place comes under the aesthetic. I think that a garden sort of gives us just in a, in a primal sort of way, it just sort of connects us to our roots, I guess. Here at Eagles Bluff, because we're slightly lower than Tenterfield itself, 150 metres lower, uh, it is warmer in the winter, hotter in the summer, and we live on a really dry continent. The weather at best is unpredictable and I think it's very important that the plants that we choose for our gardens have a, a huge degree of drought hardiness. One of the reasons I love Eagles Bluff so much is because it is less frosty in the winter. So I have been able to grow many more drought hardy plants like Australian natives. We were definitely wanting a block of land with a river that was perhaps a little bit more wild, more quintessentially Australian. And I can still feel the excitement I felt. I was looking back down the river and I just couldn't imagine getting bored with looking at that view. There are two things I look at when I'm designing a garden. The first is connecting the garden to the house. The next really important thing is to connect the garden to the landscape. I try and enhance views. I try and work with the, the, the contours of the land. And shelter and shade are paramount in our hot summers. Pete and I bought Glenrock in 1989. There was very little really Australian home grown at the time. So the garden at Glenrock is very much more traditional. Glenrock was my experimental garden. I had to learn about the climate, I had to learn about the soils, I had to learn about design, and I had to learn about plants. Whereas here at Eagles Bluff, the landscape is much more dominant. And with the backdrop that I have here at Eagles Bluff, the landscape is so dramatic, it didn't take long to furnish a foreground for it. Probably one of the most important aspects that I look at is the foliage. The shape, the texture, the size and the colour particularly. Looking at our winter garden landscape now, I realise how important foliage colour is. And an important um, design premise for me is to incorporate um, elements of the natural environment. Living here in Tenterfield, we have an abundance of natural rock and um, I started to feel the need or the, the desire to pick up stones and start building walls. Well, we're sitting in the garden here today at Horse Island which is a place on the south coast of New South Wales, tucked in the estuary of a big lake system, the Churros Lakes. The garden covers quite a large area, like 10 hectares. My Great great grandfather had a big garden nearby here, so I have that family connection. The island itself, it has a diverse range of vistas because it's hills and flats, and 
many, many trees, ranging from the mangroves on the foreshore and, and the casuarinas to all the eucalypts and lots of spotty gums. Some more densely forested areas and some open areas. So anything that I did was just an additional bonus and I don't claim any credit really for the beauty of this place because it was beautiful when we came here. But as we did a few things like putting in some power lines that opened up vistas, I saw possibilities. I do like to do things so that wherever you are, you can look all around you and you can see a beautiful picture. Well, I started to use Australian plants at the beginning because I knew that it was going to be easy to learn about one sort of planting. And then when I realised what these Australian plants were all about, I was happy to go with it. Well, we do have plant collections. The most interesting was put together by Peter Old, Australia's resident grevillea expert. And I love the fact that a lot of our beautiful plants here originated from Western Australia. So this is Wirrawilla and uh, this is uh, not far from home. Um, it, it's also a garden that's almost as old as my own, so one probably started on 25 years ago. We originally designed a circular driveway that was very traditional, works in with the old camellias that put wine magnolia and the trees that were already there. And then from there, there's this amazing lake that really is the jewel in the crown. The lake is, is what supports the orchard. It's, it's all the irrigation for the place that comes down and gives us this beautiful backdrop to everything. From the house, we're actually able to walk on the bank of the dam to come up into a new area that we designed that's got almost like a, a little maze in through the front of it. From there, there's an area that may be sort of like a, a sculpture lawn. Then we can push further in through the orchard. And there's sort of like this little sneaky area in the back of the dam that we thought uh, where the water first comes in from the property up above, we thought this might be a good spot to put in a boardwalk. We've also been sort of creating this new garden that works in quite close to the house. So the house is connected to a new garage bunker. It's a more contemporary element. It feels partly submerged because we've also created a garden on the roof of the garage. So we can see the dam, we can see lots of elements of the garden just from that vantage point. The natural landscape is so amazing here, just with the gaimi lilies, the angophras, all the natural trees. It's quite untouched, the landscape itself. So the boardwalk sort of gives us an opportunity, I guess, to see the garden from a whole new perspective, I guess, and we don't need to do too much. So certainly most of my designs compared to other designers are plant-based, but they're plant-based because I've spent so much time with plants themselves. So I used to have uh, a nursery in Sydney so I used to go to people's homes give them advice and from then I sort of became more interested in design itself. I've been at my own place now for 28 years so I used to take home those truckloads of plants every day and wonder what I was going to do with them. So then those lessons that I've learned at home have then taught me what to do for other people. But I think from then I sort of developed this interest in how to make a place work better for people. I like creating a mood, I like to create a space that feels comfortable to be in. You know, the same as an architect would with a home, you know, we can do the same thing in a garden. This particular place I've had a long association with personally, but it's uh, Bradley's Head within Sydney Harbour. And it's an important place because there's different layers here. The Aboriginal layers are present everywhere. There's the layers of defence, layers of public park, layers of national park. Bradley's Head is named after Lieutenant William Bradley from the Sirius and the First Fleet. Its Aboriginal name is Barogi or Talangai watch out or tongue, a tongue of land. And so it's natural that it was sought after as gun emplacements. On the headland, there's a definite contrast between the natural and the 
human-made elements. That contributes to its sense of garden, particularly within what I call Sydney's best open space, which is the harbour. I think people do enjoy the, the comfort of seeing the city from the bush, from the design team as a urban garden for Sydney. Being a fragment of Sydney Harbour National Park, one can look at Bradley's Head as being a remnant piece of indigenous flora, but parts of it are more natural than others. And so it has the illusion of being completely natural, but once you look at it very closely, you find that it's more of a construction. Well, the real impetus for the projects came from the need to increase visitation facilities within the National Park to create a gathering place for people to watch yachting during the Olympics and things like that. And the first project that was realised was the Wharf Area Amphitheatre. And the other aspect of it was to try and use sandstone as being harmonious with the sandstone that's on the site and harmonious with the sandstone fortifications. Seapiece is a, a fairly substantial property for this area, um, which was previously a, a rural uh, farming grazing property. And it's just about five minutes drive out of Byron Bay. It's not just a straightforward property with regeneration of, of native species or endemic species. So it's become a bit of a, a collector's garden. It's subtropical for the most part, but the array of species that are here come from all over the world. So there are Madagascan plants, African plants. When we came across CPs, it was ostensibly cleared with some gullies that were planted with, or had some original rainforest and had been replanted to some degree. And it's just been quite an adventure and a labour of love and a passion for Tony and I. The first thing is that we've both been very interested in uh, natural history and conservation, but we didn't set out with the aim of creating a biological arc, but that seems to be the direction we've headed. And in the process, of course, we've met some wonderful characters. We're collecting uh, mainly, you know, starting with local species, but going right through the spectrum of all the rare and endangered uh, species of the subtropics and tropics and then collecting trees from overseas which in some places have actually disappeared in their native environment. So everything's going to be catalogued in, in digital and, and hard copy so that in the event that we're all dead someone can come and work out what everything is you know to do justice to the the plants and the amount of plants that are here and the rare species otherwise if no one knows what they are then essentially it's sort of all been for naught. I started off in reforestation. We used to just go into bits of bush that were starting to regenerate species and take the weeds out. But now we spend a lot of our time planting trees, maintaining the weedscape, and we've been doing that now for 10 years in this session. And some of the older forests are already self-managing, so we don't have to go back there again. I think originally when we acquired the piece, we really weren't thinking of a garden per se at all. But fairly early on in the piece, we were introduced to Lisa Hochhauser, who's um, a local landscape architect, and she was able to put together a master plan for us, which created a revision of the way that you access the property. So we have that, the driveway that you come up now with, which is lined by the fig trees, the positioning of the lakes and the dams and those things that provide beautiful backdrops, but also provide irrigation for the gardens. The um, plantation that we have and the organic gardens, the orchards and things like that. <laughs> Prince Alfred Park for us was such an amazing commission. We were so lucky. It was such a joy to work on that project. We obviously inherited a landscape there that had been ironbark forest and then cleared, made to Cleveland paddocks. And then Benjamin Backhouse did a design in 1860 for this intercolonial exhibition where we had the incredible wedding cake of the exhibition building, avenues of trees. So in some cases we were revisiting that work. For example, bring back the meadows, completing lost 
lines of planting and in other cases we are really looking at the sustainability of this place. For example, the, the line of fig trees along Cleveland Street, that whole stretch suddenly became transformed with this lush grasses that cut out the traffic and really contained that, that edge of the park. So it's an incredibly eclectic landscape because obviously we've got more playful elements and it is very much a local park as well as a, a regional park and people come there for picnics. There's always people playing basketball there. People are in the pool at the crack of dawn. There's dog walkers and the joggers and it's got an incredible life across the whole spectrum of the day. Clearly Prince Alfred Park demonstrates that it's a greener city in the sense that the quality of the open space has just improved. But I think it is a neck and neck race. We need to find more open space and we need to green it as well. So obviously a roof garden is a direct translation of that. So this little roof garden is a great space that generally our office is privileged to be able to use. So it is a little oasis of green in the densest suburb in Australia really. So if you just need to sort of calm down, collect yourself, there's nothing like green to help you do that. And Paddington Reservoir is the most beautiful secret little spot. Not so secret, but it's an amazing opportunity to actually go down again into a somewhere that's taken away from the street. It has the incredible architecture of that reservoir, those beautiful arches, and the sense of holding a very tranquil space where nature has actually colonised the city. And obviously Central Park is a new iteration of that. I guess we're really testing how effective green walls can be in managing climate change in a way, the heat generation off built form. And all of these are real test cases of how urban life can actually evolve over the next decade. I think it's personal, but I loved, love getting out in the morning or any time of the day. And somehow this thing always strikes you with some sort of wonder, you know, if there's a red-bellied black snake that lives in there and I, w I want to see that every morning and I go out to see it every morning and I just get a great sense of pleasure from it. For me, gardens are a link between the wild and the civilised and it's a way of, um, I think there's a freedom that comes with a garden. It's this feeling of peacefulness that you can get in a garden that is what ultimately I think we're looking for. It's a very powerful connection and uh, it feels alive. <laughs>